Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome in this Co Everything Smarties webinar. My name is Natalie, and I will be the host of this webinar. Our presenter for today is Thomas. Uh, Thomas is Senior Research Innovation Manager here at Insights, and in this small hour, he will tell you all about the shift from crowd everything to co everything. Uh, it's Important to mention that when you have questions during this session, you can always ask them in the community chat on the left, and then afterwards, we will be happy to answer them for you. So, Thomas, uh, if you're ready, you can take over from here. Good luck. Okay, thank you, Natalie. Um, good. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining this uh, Smarties webinar. Uh, I'm Thomas, and in this presentation, I'd like to introduce you to the concept of Go Everything and how the itch of users in innovation is providing huge opportunities for brands. As we're shifting from random acts of creativity by everyday people to more organized initiatives such as crowdfunding, for example. As making things is part of who we all are, uh, I would like to introduce myself to a couple of products that define me. Well, first of all, I have a background in product design with a specific interest in understanding people. Understanding people and what is driving them, what are their unfulfilled needs. Um, and here on the, on the right you see one of my projects in interaction design, which is a little device provoking specific behavior by users when they're interacting with it, behavior like helpfulness, like creativity. Um, now I'm a research innovation manager uh, at Insight, so my focus is shifting uh, from doing it myself to actually uh, finding out how users can play a role in innovation and how this collaboration with users can add value to the innovation process. Um, and you see there a very nice uh, Heineken bottle. Uh, and in this presentation, you will discover also uh, one of the favorite, one of my favorite projects, um, how Heineken is actually involving users uh, in their open design explorations project. But that's for later. A uh, final fact about me is that I have a kind of a continuous need for uh, inspiration and for information. So I'd like to stay connected to an immense list of both online media like blogs, but also offline media such as magazines, wallpaper, for example. Um, and I would even like to introduce you to my all-time favorite edition of the wallpaper magazine. And that's the one you see on the bottom of the screen. So this is my all-time favorite wallpaper. I really love it. It's so important for me that I'm spending some time on it to introduce it, to show it to you. And what makes this specific version of wallpaper so important is simply that I have designed it myself. So Wallpaper has created this nifty little online design tool for its subscribers to allow them to create their very own cover. So in a very easy drag and drop format in this online app, uh, you could create your online cover, which was then printed uh, and delivered at your doorstep. So their subscribers could have their custom cover. So I love it because I made it myself. So that's an important thought to hold. I love it because I made it myself. And it's an important thought to hold on to because I think and I'm pretty sure that I'm not the only one. So if you just think about it for yourself, um, you might recognize this if you have ever assembled a piece of IKEA furniture, for example. And what we see is when people construct products themselves, like IKEA furniture, they tend to overvalue their creations, a phenomenon known as the IKEA effect. So you see that the act of making something is actually creating value. The act of contributing in this design process is creating value. The active participation of the crowd 
is not limited to magazine covers, is not limited to uh, IKEA furniture. We actually live in a world of crowd everything. So if I look around me, and I will challenge you to also do the same, it's really striking to see how empowered people around you are, just everyday people, users and consumers. And I did the test and I will introduce you to a couple of my friends who are just everyday users, but they are very empowered in doing different innovation initiatives. This is Oliver. Uh, he is a singer who likes to share his talent with the rest of the world uh, by broadcasting himself on YouTube. So he's recording covers, he's writing his own songs, uh, he's making and editing his own videos, and he's putting everything together and distributing this on his YouTube channel. Khalifa, he is a total car freak. He owns a 1972 Citroën SM, which is a collaboration uh, between Citroën and Maserati. Uh, and an amazing car, by the way. Uh, and in this picture, what you see is not just them restoring the car to its original state, they are actually modifying the V6 engine to overcome a weakness in the original design. Based on plans they have found in an online forum where other owners of this car actually share uh, their endeavors, their challenges, and the solutions they come up with. And a couple of months ago, uh, Ian, who is uh, an actor, asked me uh, if I would support a production of a film that he's part of. And crowdfunding platforms like Indiegogo, like Kickstarter, uh, are really growing, so they're very ready to become mainstream if they are not yet mainstream. Uh, and these crowdfunding platforms, these crowdfunding campaigns are actually both solving a need of a creative, being it a professional or an amateur creative, but they're also solving a need for the consumers. Because consumers like to presume, they like to be involved before the launch of the actual product. This, for example, is a wooden wallet, and I was very happy uh, to like back the campaign myself and then uh, be the first to carry one of these wallets with me. Uh, and this crowdfunding mechanism is almost a survival of the fittest principle, where only products that are relevant and attractive enough to consumers actually get the funding to be produced and reach the market. So again, uh, a very interesting mechanism. So if we think about it, these examples, we actually see that users are spontaneously active in key areas of innovation, from coming up with a solution to their problems, to actually building products, making improvements along the way. So these are typically things or challenges or tasks that all of us are doing. And we'd like to think that we're pretty good at it. So we can ask ourselves, why are everyday people, why are our users, our consumers taking part in this? What is driving them to spontaneously take over and participate in some or all of these tasks? And when you look at them individually, you actually see that the answer is pretty clear. All of these people, these empowered consumers, are solving their own problems. They're basically scratching their own itch just like a lot of successful entrepreneurs do. They solve their own problem, find out they're not alone, and then they start a business. So it is the itch that is driving them. And this itch is exactly a quality which might be missing when innovation gets too professional. We are not solving our own issues anymore, and somehow all the processes, the techniques, the methods that we use are not completely making up for that. Muji, not sure if you know this brand, but it's uh, a Japanese consumer goods firm. And they have experimented with developing both user-generated and designer-generated products. A very interesting study, because it's over in a longer period um, over time, 
uh, what they saw is that in the first year after introduction, the sales revenues from user-generated products, such as this floor sofa that you see on the screen, for example, uh, were three times higher than those of designer-generated products. So the sales revenues of these user-generated products were three times higher after the first year than the ones of designer-generated products. And these effects even increased over time and the user-generated products were more likely to survive the three-year period that the results were observed. So we can summarize this in people like to take part in innovation. If you follow this example, they can be pretty good at it. And the act of taking part in innovation is actually creating value for them. They work as play. They do it in the leisure time. So in this context, we should really watch out for a parallel universe where professionals and amateurs are innovating independently from each other. And then suddenly, before you know it, your users might become your competitors. Think about if you look at the hotel industry, think about Airbnb. If you think about car rental, there are now similar services where users uh, allow other users to share uh, their car. So watch out for this parallel universe. A lot of companies are aware of this and they try to, on the one hand, be more open in their innovation by facilitating collaboration with their empowered consumers. But another challenge is that innovation should also become more agile. So part of the itch that is driving users is actually impatience. It's itchy, so you're impatient. So if you're not fast enough, they will do it themselves and they might become a competitor. So you have to be flexible enough to spot these opportunities to join forces with these users. And there are different ways, of course, of being more open. Most popular ones are crowdsourcing and co-creation. And while crowdsourcing is more an open call for ideas, think about uh, my Starbucks ID, co-creation is a more intensive collaboration with a smaller group of people, often with more or on a more focused topic. And to have this type of interaction, a smaller group of people, it's also often facilitated on a closed platform. So these are popular methods, crowdsourcing, co-creation. The question is, are they enough? Are they enough to move from crowd everything to co-everything? From activities in innovation of the crowd to really collaborating and doing co-everything. Well, as innovation is getting more and more complex, crowdsourcing, co-creation might not be enough. Innovation is getting more complex because we're not just thinking about product features nowadays. We're thinking about innovation beyond the product. And more specifically, I'd like to highlight three levels on which innovation is currently going beyond the product uh, that are particularly interesting um, and also very on trend. Uh, and the first is holistic brand design. Uh, the second is the product service system. Uh, and the third is the experience environment. And each of them requires this um, specific approach of user involvement. So first of all, holistic brand design. This is about translating insights into this authentic, holistic experience, covering all the touch points of your brand. And that can really go from sound to rituals, for example. Natural beauty brands bear essentials um, is a great example. And they have embedded a simple swirl tap buff foundation application ritual into every brand experience, both in media, retail. So a user observation, so if somebody applies foundation, that's typically in the swirl, tap, buff action. Uh, so this ritual almost uh, becomes the essence of 
the brand by highlighting this into all touch points. It's really reinforcing the experience and creating a connection to the product and to the brand just by going through the experience itself. So that's an example of a holistic brand design where the basis is a user observation. With an emphasis on user experience, and less emphasis on ownership of actual products, we see a shift from products to product service ecosystems. Uh, and with innovations such as the electric BMW, this goes beyond just delivering the infrastructure. Think about the charging station uh, you see on the left. Um, it really goes beyond just this infrastructure. So probably the biggest barrier for adoption of these type of cars is the insight that people typically buy a car for this one time in the year they need to drive from Belgium to Switzerland for their ski holiday. So for a longer distance uh, than is actually suitable for this vehicle. So to anticipate this barrier, BMW is actually providing longer range vehicles when owners of this i3 need to drive longer distances, a solution clearly anticipating this obstacle or need. And a third level, just to give you an idea of how innovation uh, is going beyond the product, is getting more and more complex, um, is the experience environment. And although the screenshots might not look like a great experience, it actually is. While I was reading uh, a book on my Kindle app. I wanted to highlight a specific part of the text and it was really delightful that suddenly I could not only see my highlights but I could also see underlines what other people have highlighted in this book. Popular highlights by others. So this becomes like almost like a 21st century book club where a group of friends read the same book and they talk about it, but you're actually sharing your thoughts with the rest of the world and they are sharing their thoughts with you. And of course, it might be uh, a very interesting time saver if you just read all the, uh, the highlights in the book. You do capture the essence. Uh, conclusion here is that users are part of the service. So by highlighting things by using the product, you're actually creating value for other users. And that's what the experience environment is all about. And that's increasingly uh, something to think about as a brand. How can your users, by using your service, by adopting your products, how can they create value for other users? So to get to these levels of innovation, we need to move from crowd everything to co-everything. We need to join forces and tap into structural collaboration. And we can do this by targeting specific profiles of users uh, and by taking them from the very front end of innovation to observations to, to the very back end of innovation uh, in fine tuning prototypes, for example. So let's see what all these key phases are about in just not involving them in one moment in time, which is typical for co-creation, which is typical for crowdsourcing, but by taking them along in the innovation journey. So let's start with the very front end. And you might think if I say innovation, the first word that pops into mind might be ideas, ideation, ID generation. But Actually, everything starts with insights. You need a good insight to come to great ideas. And the definition of an insight can be blurry, but this is a definition we like to use, which makes it clear uh, and easy to understand. And that's, it's me, aha, uh -huh, there's an emotion, and there are opportunities. It's me. It's recognizable, I believe it, I recognize it. Aha, uh -huh. it's surprising, it's fresh, um, it's something new or it has never been 
put or formulated in those words. And then, of course, there is an emotion, which can be a frustration, a negative emotion, a friction, but it can also be a delight. And then this provides opportunities, opportunities uh, on and potential on a brand level, on an innovation level, and of course also economic potential. On a brand level, there should be a brand fit between the insight uh, and the brand uh, for it to be suitable as a starting point for an innovation journey. Um, it should trigger, the, just reading the insight should trigger new ideas, so it should really fuel creativity. And then, of course, also economic potential. Users uh, must be willing to, um, or it must add value to users, uh, either to improve the service or for them uh, to be willing to pay for a solution uh, on this friction. So let's uh, give a short case to highlight this. Uh, the open design explorations, which I've already mentioned at the start, by Heineken. Uh, so what is this project all about? Well, to, uh, to gain credibility from within the design scene, Heineken has set up a unique project. They're open design explorations. And in just one year, talking about Agile, they got inspired by clubbers, developed design briefs, crowdsourced a group of designers from Milan, Tokyo, Sao Paulo, and New York, generated new ideas, and developed the best concept into a fully functioning concept club, the Heineken Concept Club, which was launched at the Design Week in Milan in 2012. But how did, it, how did we get there? Well, of course, before we can generate good ideas, we need good insight. So as a backbone of these complex innovation projects, we actually have an online user community or consumer consulting board, a group between 50 and 150 users who are connected on this closed online platform for a longer period in time three weeks, three months, a year. And they can either be active all the time, but they can also be re reactivated uh, whenever needed in the process. So you really fit this iteration, uh, which is natural for innovation. Uh, and depending on the innovation challenge, you plug in different methods from self-ethnography to blogging, to conversations, multimedia, to an ID generation tool. Uh, so here, we connected with 120 clubbers, people who love to go out to clubs, are dancing on a box in the hottest clubs all over the world uh, every single weekend. Uh, and they are sharing their stories, their experiences here uh, with us. And you see different rooms, so it can go from nightlife experience, the best, the worst experience uh, in clubbing, uh, going through their... Um, social media, for example, uh, and reposting the pictures they have shared on their Facebook, sharing them also with us. Uh, and next room is Club Journey, which is really about focusing on different touch points throughout uh, the night. This can be in time, what happens before, what happens during, what happens after, but also focused on different elements of the club, from the entrance, the DJ booth, to the bar. And then there is trend watching, so we're also using them to observe what's hot and happening uh, in their environment, specifically with this target group uh, of Gen Y clubbers. Uh, and of course, a social corner, because it's not only what we put on the agenda that counts, but the golden nugget is often coming from these bottom-up discussions. So there, they own that place um, of the community, uh, and they can actually share um, different other discussions, topics there. And based on this connection with clubbers in the first phase, based on these stories, um, we were actually able to develop the design briefs for the Open Design Explorations project. The next challenge was to inspire a group of young designers. Uh, so therefore, we developed an interactive infographic, which is freely available on nightlifejourney.com, where the designers can really browse through the night. Uh, they can 
check out the different touch points, the different key phases in a night out. And when they tap a shoulder of one of these silhouettes, they can discover the insight behind it. So different phases from connecting, meeting up with friends before, how to pick the venue, what to do before, what to wear, to discovering, which is in and around the entrance, getting a drink around the bar, dancing, makes sense, but also a very new area is a cooling down area. So when you come back from the dance floor, uh, you're maybe a bit sweaty, you have this area where you can cool down with uh, lower light, lower beats, less uh, stimulation, basically, uh, going to ending the night, the final touch point to make this lasting impression. And the impact of mapping these insights that way and developing this uh, into design briefs is already visible in the layout of the club. So this is actually following the journey of the clubbers and these different phases from connecting to discovering in this discovery entrance tunnel, getting a drink, dancing, cooling down, which is the blue area, to ending the night. So I mentioned you need a good insight to get to a great idea. Uh, well, let's share one of these insights. It's so frustrating not to be noticed by the bartender. I'm clearly trying to get his attention. However, others are being served before me. So just do the check for yourself. Uh, do you recognize it? It's me. Uh, do you have this aha moment from Okay, it's a fresh way, it has never been put that way. And do you feel the emotion, almost the frustration that is in this insight? And this has actually led or inspired the designers, this insight, to develop a completely interactive bar surface. So the complete bar was interactive, and as long as you could touch the bar, you could let the bartender know that you were there and you could place your order. And the concentric circles you see around this Heineken bottle silhouette are actually showing how long you're waiting. So the broader they go, the longer the person has been waiting there. Because in the end, the frustration comes from the very simple mechanism that users are expecting first come, first served. So clearly anticipating this need. Of course, people are not only at a bar, to, uh, for a transactional experience, not only there to order a drink. They have different motives for being there. And you could also use this to play a game of virtual football if you have four bottles, or if you slide over the surface, uh, you can attract the attention of an interesting stranger at the other side of the bar. So this is about, based on observation, based on ethnography and a connection with users, they are helping you to develop design briefs, to get inspiration, to be on the right track from the start. Currently, this Heineken Open Design Explorations project uh, is in its uh, second edition, uh, which is now in production. Uh, and this time, we're taking on lounging with a group of designers from Warsaw, Singapore, Mexico City, and New York. And again, Heineken customers, clubbers are playing a vital part in this innovation journey, but more uh, will follow in the next months on this project. Although there's typically no lack of ideas in innovation teams, generating them together with users can increase their relevance. And by having a holistic view on this user, we can also understand which ideas we want to chase. So you might think, we have enough of professional creatives in the house who can develop ideas. They are trained to do this. Involving this user is increasing the relevance because the users are solving or helping to solve their own problems. An example of such a complex service innovation challenge is the transfer journey of Air France and KLM. Transfer is... Uh, special moments in a flight journey because it's actually a moment where travelers don't choose for. Not only do they not choose for it, it's also a moment where a lot can go wrong. 
So it's often characterized by negative emotions. It's often the worst part of your flight, of your travel journey. So therefore, given that it's so complicated, there are a lot of different stakeholders. Think about customs, security, the airline, the airport, other travelers. It's so complicated. It's very, there are huge challenges, but also huge opportunities. Uh, so therefore, Air France and KLM have joined forces with their frequent flyers, really the experts in transfer, because they go through this process really often in trying to develop new concepts uh, to improve this transfer journey. First, in an ethnography phase, similar to the Heineken approach, to really immerse in this transfer journey, and next in an ideation phase to, based on the insights, develop new ideas. And just like the design tool that Heineken offered me, sorry, that wallpaper offered me to create my very own wallpaper cover, it's also about giving your users the tools to share their ideas with you. And not only just the tools, but also making this a fun experience because Fun is actually also uh, gamification, will trigger this and will stimulate creativity. So here you see uh, a challenge, which is time. There's a countdown, so there is this urgency. Um, it's mentioning the insight and then users uh, can post new ideas, but also comment on each other's ideas. And that's really uh, the value that by commenting on each other's ideas, ideas get better. They're challenging each other, almost battling, defending their ideas. Uh, and this is gamified on an, not on an individual user, but on an idea level. So as users are co-creating, as they are um, further improving ideas, uh, the status is actually changing from mining to rough diamond to polished diamond to uh, the diamond ring you see on the right. For this objective, co-creating, generating new ideas based on insights, we're not just involving any users. For the first phase in this project for Air France KLM, we were looking for users who had a lot of transfer experiences, really the expert in transfer. But if you also want to generate new ideas, you want people who have the ability to come up with and express their ideas. And this is actually not a new thought. I was born in uh, 1986, and this is the year Von Hippel coined the term lead users. So 1986, it's been a while, and you see that we've been talking about it a lot uh, with different names. You see lead users, market mavens, innovators, prosumers, emergent consumers. So we've been talking about it a lot, but somehow if you look at business, we didn't crack the code yet. A lot of these lead users are not yet very present in our organization. So in business, the impact is not yet as clear as it should be. What has changed from a consumer perspective over the past years, since 1986, is more outspoken. And it's simply technology. We see that internet penetration is booming, and although consumers have always been talking about products, about brands, through social media, the world became their audience. Word of mouth and word of mouse have become crucial for the adoption of new products and services. So let's think about innovation in the context of an innovation conversation nation. What differentiates co-creation and structural collaboration from crowdsourcing is that you have the ability to carefully select the users who can take part. And this is really crucial, who you are collaborating with. Typically users who identify strongly with the topic or the brand and not just professional creatives. So you see this high involvement versus low involvement, uh, the vertical axis. So we would only go for people who are highly involved in any type of um, collaboration project. For innovation purpose, um, we distinguish two profiles in the co-creation phase. People who are socially independent, 
on the left, who focus more on product features, on characteristics. These are our independent innovators. And these are the people who can come up with out of the box ideas, uh, which might be a little more uh, crazy and very specific maybe to their needs. Uh, and on the other side, you have people who have a strong influence on their environment, the social influencers, and they can help in making these ideas uh, ready for a broader audience. So by having these two groups of people, uh, there's a very uh, interesting interaction, which is actually resulting uh, in both unique and relevant ideas. And of course, it's not just these two groups of people. It's also about involving uh, the professional creatives or innovators in this co-creation approach. So they're not doing it. They're not just doing it on their own. Uh, they're in it together with you. Not only are these specific profiles able to collaborate, we see that they're also willing to do this. Uh, from our social media, uh, social media around the world study, uh, we learned that 80% of users want to co-create with the brands they like. And some profiles don't just want to collaborate, some demand to. If you think about Gen Y, these are users, a brand can only create value for them when they're actually also having an impact on that brand. Uh, I am what I create. And although you might think that this specific profile of users who can think along with you, uh, who can help you in generating new ideas, new concepts, uh, is very difficult to find, uh, there might be a surprising shortcut. Because people who have similar interests tend to come together, they tend to connect. So if you think back about Khalifa, the guy um, who was restoring or modifying uh, the vintage Citroën Maserati engine, uh, he is actually sharing his endeavors together with other fans of the brand on a natural, in an open virtual community. So that's also uh, a way to really find these users where they are, where they might be already sharing new ideas. This is a challenging phase and not just it's not a challenging phase because it's challenging for users. The co-creation of new ideas, developing them into concepts, it's a challenging phase because it's typically something uh, where professionals think that they are, uh, they are trained to do this and they are the perfect, they have the perfect profile uh, to solve these issues. But still, as I already mentioned, it's not just about this creativity, it's also about the fact that the users are solving their own uh, issues, so this can add extra relevance. Some tips and tricks, some key uh, tips to make this work is of course, first of all, define the solution space with insights. Just as if you would brief, develop a design brief internally, also in this co-creation, it's about being open, uh, it's about inspiring these users. Then of course, find the right users, so your innovators, your influentials. And then, last but not least, develop new ideas together. It's not about having users co-create new ideas. The team at the brand, at the organization, should also be involved, should also be jumping off uh, new ideas in this process. So co is not short for consumers, it's short for collaborate. Co everything, collaborate all the way. And in moving from co-creation to structural collaboration, it can be necessary to engage your users into the very end, throughout the very end of innovation. And especially, of course, when users are part of your ecosystem. Think about the example of the Amazon Kindle, where users are also providing value for other users. And also in this next example for um, Vodafone. Vodafone uh, took on the challenge to get prototypes of their new mobile services out of the lab as soon as possible in order to finish them together with key consumers. And by allowing people to use the service for a longer 
period in time, they were really able to understand triggers, understand barriers in the journey from discovering the app to actually adopting this app. And by mapping these in time, they could see, okay, where are our users dropping out? Uh, what is delighting them? And what are the things uh, we should focus on, both in the further development of the service as in the communication of the service? And here again, users connected uh, in this online platform, uh, being able to join this asynchronous discussion, this asynchronous uh, pre-launch prototype testing um, at the moment at the location uh, where they prefer it. So they can just log on at any given moment in time and share their thoughts, share their experience, uh, upload screenshots from their uh, smartphone directly via uh, the mobile website. Um, so these technology is really now there to engage with users uh, longer in time and at any given moment in time. So, um, how do you get started with CoEverything? I think that's the final question to be answered here. Um, first of all, I'm pretty sure that your users, your consumers, are already very itchy, that the itch is already driving them. So they might even be already involved in crowd everything, in spontaneous innovation initiatives. So it's now really you uh, who should take the first step towards go everything, uh, a step that will require an actual mind shift in your innovation team because you're collaborating, you're letting go, and you're really joining forces with your users. The complex challenges in innovation which we're facing nowadays require not just crowdsourcing, not just co-creation, it's more of a structural way of collaborating that is needed with the right users at the right time in your journey. Uh, so it's really about developing a custom, custom approach uh, and thinking in a realistic way when you need, when users can provide the biggest added value in your innovation journey and also tapping into the iterative opportunities of getting back, sharing concepts, fine-tuning them together, taking a break and so on until uh, it's ready for launch and even post-launch. And then, uh, of course, talking about um, opportunities. Uh, when there are local differences, you would focus on different markets. Uh, or you would come up with a global offering. So these are two approaches. In the Heineken example, uh, for example, we were looking for universal club insights. So we gathered an international group of clubbers into one project, which was a very specific objective. While if you see for Vodafone, these social um, Vodafone applications, users were part of the experience environment uh, where we set up different communities in different local markets, uh, Germany, UK, the Netherlands, Spain, Italy, uh, and Portugal uh, to really tap into the cultural uh, differences in fine tuning uh, this product to the needs of the audience. Um, so I'm not sure what time it is in your time zones, uh, but I do have some final takeaway for you. First of all, think about innovation beyond the product. Different levels uh, that I have tapped into were holistic brand design, the product service ecosystem and the experience environment, but there are uh, even more levels. Uh, luckily, we can approach innovation within a conversation nation uh, where users are empowered, they are able and willing uh, to take part in this journey. And then it's a marathon, not a sprint. Uh, so really in moving from crowd everything to co everything, uh, move from ad hoc to structural and take your users from the very front end to the very back end of innovation. Um, I think now we'll have some time for questions. If you would have questions at a later moment in time, uh, definitely feel free to reach out, uh, LinkedIn, email. Uh, I tweet about co-creation, co-everything, uh, innovation, 
marketing research um, and definitely also share your itch with us. All right, thank you very much, Thomas, for sharing this story with us. Uh, like Thomas already said, if you have any additional questions, you can always contact him. He'll be happy to help you out on a later time as well. I see there are not uh, questions for now, so then I can just thank everyone for joining. I hope you enjoyed uh, the story of Thomas. And like I said, if you have any other questions, you can always ask them later. So enjoy the rest of your day. Bye. Okay, thanks everyone. Bye.